tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, as Lauren has said, I'm Professor Wendy Lana, I'm the Provost, and I have to pause here because I'm not actually sure whether I should say Victoria University of Wellington or yes. University yes. of Wellington. <laughs> anyway, in either case, it's my very great pleasure to welcome you this evening to the uh, latest in the University's Provost lecture series. Now, as New Zealand's globally ranked capital city university, we really relish the opportunity to share with you our world-leading research and our thinking with the wider Wellington community. Now, as many of you know, we do that throughout the year with our very popular series of public inaugural lectures by new professors. These Provost lectures complement those allowing us to offer an even wider taste of the research that we are conducting to address the social, economic and environmental challenges that the world faces. Now today's speaker, Professor Lisa Marriott, is an excellent example of the type of active and engaged academic that the university values so highly in our commitment to global civic citizenship. And this is part of the reason for the name change, is to really capture that shift. Now, unfortunately, we've got, as you will have seen, a bit of a flicker in our screen, but I am very confident that that will not detract from the quality of what we are about to hear this evening. Now, many of you from outside the university will already know Lisa from media coverage most recently relating to price signals as the key to increasing the uptake of electric vehicles in New Zealand. Lisa is a professor in the School of Accounting and Commercial Law. She has spent several years researching whether people in New Zealand are treated equally when it comes to welfare, pensions and sentences for financial crimes. Her research interests include social justice and inequality, including attitudes towards blue collar and white collar offending. And she has a particular interest in the behavioral impacts of taxation. Before joining the world of academia, Lisa was a chartered accountant working in New Zealand's public sector, as well as spending 10 years in the private sector in the United Kingdom. Her work has been published across a wide range of disciplines, including political science, public policy, law and criminology. She's written two books, written chapters in many edited texts and published in highly ranked journals. Now tonight Lisa is going to talk to us about the criminalisation of poverty in New Zealand, questioning whether those who are least disadvantaged in New Zealand fare worse than those who are in relatively privileged position. Lisa set out to explore this topic after seeing that white collar criminals received much more favourable treatment than their poorer counterparts in New Zealand. This of course being a country that holds itself out as being egalitarian. I have absolutely no doubt that her lecture this evening or afterwards in conversation with me, and then you too will have a chance to ask her questions, that what Lisa will do for us is highlight issues of equity and privilege in New Zealand, drawing on her research examining tax evasion and welfare fraud, as well as other research that she has taken on tax and social justice. So please join with me in welcoming Professor Lisa Marriott to the party. Kia ora and Wendy, thank you very much indeed for that uh, very generous introduction. So I am here to talk to you tonight about the criminalisation of poverty in New Zealand. So some of it will be about crime, some of it will be about issues wider than crime, but we'll start here. We'll start with two primary issues that I really do want to talk about. And the first of these is how the welfare system in New Zealand 
really does sometimes set up people for failure. And this is the system that is designed to help people when they are in their most vulnerable stages. So we'll look at that, but we'll also look at situations where the system gives people some really tough choices. And in some cases, those choices can be between feeding your children and engaging in welfare fraud. Now, that's not a very nice choice for everybody, for anybody, but probably it's not too difficult to see where that decision would go. If that's your choice, you're probably going to go down the welfare fraud route. But if you do, if there is welfare fraud, it's certainly going to be treated a lot more harshly in the justice system than any other type of equivalent financial crime. So, before we go there, I do just want to tell you a little story because one of the things that Wendy did say to me is people like to know the background of research. So people like to know how you got to the topic that you're researching on. And the story behind this research starts in Christchurch uh, at about 2010. And in Christchurch, I was, um, I was working in Christchurch at the university down there. And one day I ran into somebody that I had done my master's degree with some years beforehand. And when we were catching up with what we'd been doing over the past few years, it turned out that what he had been doing was stealing money from his employer. So he had stolen a not insignificant sum of money. It was a six-figure sum of money. He had repaid none of it, didn't by all accounts seem to think that he should have to. Uh, I'll give you a little bit more context about this person. This person was, uh, he had been a policeman in the UK and he'd come to New Zealand where he had retrained and he was an accountant. So he had done this particular crime in his capacity as an accountant. Now, where we get on to the research part of it was, he had been prosecuted, he'd been convicted, and he was just finishing off his sentence. Now, his sentence was home detention with community service. Now, the community service that he was doing was being done here at Arana Wildlife Park. Now, I'm quite sure some people in the audience have probably been to Arana Wildlife Park. There's a few heads nodding. Yeah, so look, it's a nice place to go. It's a, well, you know, it's an animal wildlife park. So he was enjoying his community service so much that he was going to keep doing his, uh, or keep working there once his community service had finished. So I walked away from this conversation thinking, Really, that doesn't seem to be too much of a punishment if you volunteer to do it in your own capacity, in your own time, once it's finished. So I thought, look, I, I really need to look at this a wee bit more. But because my topic is tax and I'm not a criminologist, I thought, well, I, you know, I can't really just go and look at this. So I'll look at it from the capacity of tax and I will look at how we punish tax offenders. So what do we do when people don't comply with the tax system? So this is where the topic started and this is where we're heading now. So I am going to talk to you a wee bit about tax evasion and welfare fraud just to start with and one of the first things I'll say is I am talking about tax evasion here. So it's not tax avoidance, it's not people being clever and working within the rules to maximise their position, it's people deliberately not paying their tax, it's financial fraud. So very, very clear on this, it's fraud, it's crime. So what's the difference between tax evasion and welfare fraud? Well, actually, there's a lot of similarities first. So they're both financial fraud, they're both deliberate, they can both be quantified quite easily by the measure of harm that they result in to society and actually it makes them quite nicely comparable as well because they can be measured in a, a dollar amount. They have the same victim which is all of us and they have the same outcome which is fewer resources to invest in society as a whole. So there are two main differences. 
first one is actually how it occurs. So tax is not paying, or tax evasion rather, is not paying the tax that is legally due. Whereas welfare fraud, of course, is taking more from the welfare system than you are legally entitled to. Now, I'm not defending welfare fraud in my talk tonight. Tax evasion and welfare fraud are both crimes, but they are, well, they do come about in different ways and they do have ultimately different impacts. Now the other key difference with these two crimes is the size of the issue. So you can see the benefit fraud, welfare fraud, is uh, in 2015-16 was 24 million. Now over the time that I've been doing this research, that's been declining quite steadily. Now tax position differences, which is our nice phrase at the moment for, for tax evasion, is 1.2 <laughs> billion. So there is a significant level of different economic harm that results from these two different types of offences. So what I'm going to talk to you about now is the, the first part of the research that I did and this looked at the different ways that we investigate, prosecute and sentence the two offences. So these figures have changed a little bit over the years that I've been looking at this. So in most years we investigate around about 6,000 welfare beneficiaries and we investigate around about 1,000 taxpayers. Now in New Zealand, look this is actually not too unreasonable actually, particularly on the tax side, a lot of tax audit and investigation is risk based. So Inland Revenue do have highly sophisticated data analytics that they use to address specific areas of risk. But even so, there's still not a lot of taxpayers uh, that are investigated in, in an average year. Now, so once we get beyond the investigation part, when we look at uh, prosecutions, there's 500 to 900 in most years for welfare fraud, whereas there's 60 to 100 for tax evasion. So I'm talking about criminal prosecutions here. So again, significant differences in those numbers, especially when you consider the population base that we're talking from here. So in New Zealand, uh, the core beneficiaries are maybe around about 280,000 at the moment. So there, there's a reasonably high proportion of those wealthy beneficiaries that are investigated. Now, sentencing. This is where it does become even more interesting. So I looked at sentencing over six years and the tax data that I've got was from Inland Revenue. They very kindly provided me with very nice data on their uh, outcomes of their prosecutions. So over that six year period, there were 399 uh, criminal prosecutions. And across those 399 cases, the average tax evasion amount was around just under $230,000. So it's actually not terribly high because I'm going to show you some figures a, a little bit further on which are a lot higher than that. But for that average tax evasion of 230,000, 18% of those 399 offenders received prison sentences. Now, looking at welfare fraud, what I've had to do with welfare fraud uh, is I've had to just take a cut along the top of the most serious offences. And that's because we investigate and prosecute so many more welfare beneficiaries than we do uh, tax evaders. And we prosecute at such a lower threshold that the comparison actually just becomes quite meaningless if you compare across the whole population. So what I've done is I've just taken the most serious of cases and you can see from the figure that I've got there that's still actually a, a quite a bit lower than the average tax evasion amount. So the average welfare fraud of those most serious cases was 76,000, just over 76,000. But of those welfare fraudsters, 67% uh, of their, them, um, those fraudsters received a prison sentence. So there's some quite significant differences in the sentencing coming out there. Now, usually at this point, somebody will say to me, ah, yes, but Lisa, isn't that because the tax evaders repay all the tax that they have not paid and the welfare fraudsters 
don't. Now, when I started this, this was exactly what I thought, but it's actually completely the other way around. So of those 399 cases, two involved some repayment. One was repaid uh, in full and one repaid $5,000, which was only a tiny amount of the fraud. Now, on the other hand, with the welfare fraud, the vast majority of that welfare fraud is repaid. Now, for all the cases that I've looked at, and I have sat through a number of courts in New Zealand looking at case files, I didn't see one which didn't have this phrase on the case file. And what it means is this, this phrase, reparation order not sought. So what they're doing is they're not seeking a court ordered reparation. Instead what happens is the ministry, ministry recovers the full amount of the overpayment directly from the defendant. So this means that they basically, uh, if that person is still receiving a welfare benefit, then the repayments will start to come out of that welfare benefit. Uh, if the debt still exists exists when they turn 65 and they move on to New Zealand superannuation, then the debt will still continue to come out of that at that point. So the debts really are only written off if, uh, if the person dies and their estate is insolvent, but that's something that I'll, I'll come back to again. Now, I just wanted to digress a, a tiny bit and just talk, show you a couple of slides on some other financial fraud. So I'm just going to talk to you briefly about the Serious Fraud Office and the Financial Markets Authority. Now, the Serious Fraud Office, they are our organisation in New Zealand where, and I've, this quote on the top bullet point there is from their annual report, their core business is investigating and prosecuting white collar crime. It's what they do. So in the last year, the average value of their prosecutions was eight million per case. So they really are are dealing with the most serious financial crime. Now, the little table at the bottom there, you'll see that they received 831 complaints, they investigated 25 of those, and they prosecuted 10. Now, that's not to say that the other 821 uh, don't go anywhere, they may go to the police, they might be um, pursued there. But you can see that there's a quite a, a small amount of prosecutions happening there at the Serious Fraud Office. Now if you contrast that with the amount of investigations and prosecutions that are happening at the Ministry of Social Development, what it does tend to quite clearly show is that, um, well, we're we're investigating and prosecuting a lot more wealthy beneficiaries. But look, I, that's not actually the main point of showing you this slide. I wanted to show you how these, uh, or how the funding sits in relation to the, the, um, the amounts that we spend in investing and collecting fraud. So the Ministry of Social Development in the last financial year had 48 million to spend on investigation and collection of the overpayment and fraud. Now contrast that with, this is not just the, the amounts on the table there and not the amounts that these entities had to investigate and collect uh, fraud. These are their total budgets. So we're spending, we're funding the Ministry of Social Development more to c investigate and collect uh, welfare debt and welfare fraud than we are the entire Serious Fraud Office and Financial Markets Authority, which just tends to suggest to me that we're really not taking white collar crime at all seriously. Remember I said to you uh, just a slide or so back, the Serious Fraud Office, the average case value is $8 million. So, uh, I, well, to my mind, I think there's a lot more capacity to be funding some of the organisations that could pursue white collar criminals to a much greater extent than we currently do. So uh, back to uh, where we are, tax evasion, welfare fraud, I wanted to share with you some quotes that I've seen on case files in relation to uh, tax evasion and welfare fraud because I think they do capture to some extent again how, serious we, we, how seriously we view these crimes. 
So here's a quote from a case where there was GST fraud of $250,000. This GST fraud was committed by a lawyer, as it happens. So the tax judge said in this case, your career is now devastated. You have given 33 years of selfless service to the law. Your solicitor submits that you do not have a malicious bone in your body and if anything, you are just too eager to help others. So that is the comment on a GST fraud case. Here's another comment on another GST fraud case of 1.4 million. In that case, the the tax judge was just actually repeating that comment from uh, the uh, council, where the council had said, well, the Inland Revenue is not like a vulnerable person who is a member of a superannuation fund. It's a state enterprise. So apparently that makes it okay. Now, contrast that with a comment, and again, this is a comment that was on a welfare fraud case, but it's absolutely typical of the comments that were on welfare fraud cases. So you'll see there's a lot more going on here, but the judge said you have defrauded all of us. This is serious offending. Note the amount of the offending. It's just over $30,000. As a principle of sentencing, it strikes at the heart of the system put in place by the community, paid for by the tax, taxpayer, etc. You, to coin a modern phrase, ripped the system off. You have to be accountable for that, your conduct has to be denounced, and you have to be deterred from acting in this way. A sentence must be imposed that will deter others like-minded from acting in this way. And again, it tends to just capture quite nicely the different sentiments that sit around welfare fraud and tax evasion. Okay. Right, so now onto something slightly different again. This was a change that we made to the Social Security Act in 2014. Now what happened or the what happened when we changed the act was the change allows for the partners of people who are committing welfare fraud to be criminally liable and prosecuted for that crime. They can also be criminally liable for the debt that is generated from that crime. Now, the test is, on the bottom bullet point there, where the partner knew or ought to have known of the fraud. So they don't actually have to have known, they don't have to have known the amount, they don't have to have known how it was committed, but they ought to have known. Okay. So the issues with this, at the time that this uh, particular change was implemented, there were around about 300,000 people receiving one of the main welfare benefits, so job seeker support, sole parent support and so on. Uh, In that year, there were 208 cases of relationship fraud, which is actually what this particular uh, change of the legislation was targeted towards. Now, the issues are, first of all, it departs from the general principles of criminal law. It doesn't require any particular positive act on the part of the partner for them to be liable for or prosecuted for the crime and liable for the debt. And of course, there's a real absence of symmetry here. We're not holding the partners of any other type of financial fraudster to the same level of accountability. So we're not holding the partners of people who are prosecuted and convicted by the Serious Fraud Office, for example. We don't think they ought to have known about the fraud. But the issues don't stop there. It's a very costly policy. It's actually revenue negative. So at the time the policy was put in place, the cabinet papers said that it would cost 1.2 million in additional costs per year to administer this change. And I did an official information act request once the policy had been in place for two years. And at that point, they'd collected 200,000. So 100,000 a year is what had been collected from the revenue outlay of 1.2 million. So we're not getting a gain from an economic perspective. We're certainly not getting a gain from any type of, of equity perspective and what it does instead is it just generates a precedent for targeting more vulnerable groups in society for a a higher level of more punitive treatment.
Okay. Now, this is just a, a segue. Uh, it's a quote from 200 years ago. The vices of the rich and great are mistaken for error, and those of the, of the poorly and lowly for crimes. But what happens when you don't have any crime? So do we treat p poor people differently when there is no crime? So I looked at what we do when people have debts, so tax debts or welfare debts. So in this case, there, there will be a tiny bit of fraud in the numbers that I'll talk to you about, but for the most part, it's legitimate debts. So this is where people have filed their tax return, but for whatever reason, not paid their tax. And in the case of welfare debt, a lot of it results from uh, things like recoverable assistance loans. So this is loans that people can get if they need, uh, or if they have emergency expenditures. Uh, and it can result from overpayments as well. And it's quite easy for welfare beneficiaries to end up in situations where they have overpayments because some uh, welfare assistance requires a, a, an estimate of income for the year ahead. So if you get that wrong, uh, it's possible that you might end up in a situation where you've received too much in the way of benefits if you've earned more in that year than you thought that you would. Okay, so uh, one of the differences is in the amount of debt that's written off. So again, you can see we don't write off much in the way of welfare debt. So there's 13 million in welfare debt written off in the last year I looked at this. Uh, we write, wrote off in that same year 1.1 million, a billion rather, in, in tax debt. Now, part of the reason for this is because of the provisions that we have to allow write-offs of these debts. So, hardship is one of them. For tax, you can ask, if you are suffering from a significant hardship, you can ask to have your tax or to be released from your tax debt. Now, what I've put on the screen here is from the Tax Administration Act, and I've highlighted one bit that we, you don't need to read the whole slide, it's just um, a bit of legislation, but I think the, the most important part is the, high, uh, the part that's in blue there. And for tax purposes, serious hardship is where the taxpayer has significant financial difficulties that arise where the, uh, the taxpayer or the dependent has a serious illness, or the taxpayer would be unable to meet minimum living expenses <coughs> estimated according to normal community standards of cost and equality. Now the other thing that I'll just mention is recovery of tax must not, as well as must not placing or must not place the taxpayer in a position of serious hardship, it also can't be an inefficient use of inland revenue resources. Now this standard here in blue, I don't think anybody would think this is unreasonable. It's just being humane and wanting people to have a reasonable standard of living, not be forced into poverty because they have tax debts. Okay. However, of course, the same standard is not applied to welfare beneficiaries. So welfare beneficiaries generally would not have their tax, uh, sorry, their, their welfare debt written off. Instead, if you are suffering serious hardship as a welfare beneficiary, what will happen is you will, if you're lucky, there will be uh, realistic repayment rates negotiated so that significant hardship is not caused. Now for welfare beneficiaries, hardship does not necessarily preclude recovery. And in exceptional circumstances, payment might be temporarily deferred until a, personal, a person's financial circumstance improves in order that significant hardship is not caused. Now, at this point, it possibly pays to reflect that it's not unfair to assume that the people that we're talking about are probably suffering from serious hardship already. They, at a minimum, don't have a job, they might be a sole parent, they may have poor health. And be, on top of that, then there is a need to demonstrate further serious hardship. And when we're talking about negotiating realistic repayment rates, 
I've talked to some budget advisors and they say, you know, this might be somebody negotiating down their $5 a week repayment because that's all they, they can afford to maybe $4 a week. So we're not talking about being overly generous with uh, negotiatings when we are talking about these realistic repayment rates. Now, I did just want to, um, to talk about one particular case because I think it illustrates a, a sort of a, 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 a point which is worth highlighting. And I don't know if you'll remember this case from a few years ago now. There was a lady called Wendy Shoebridge who lived in Lower Hutt and she was sent a letter by the Ministry of Social Development saying that she had a tax, uh, tax debt of $22,000. Now, at that point, she very sadly committed suicide. Now, subsequent to that <laughs> event, the debt was re-looked at and it was reduced to 5500 and further down the track, it was revised again and they decided that, in fact, she didn't ever have a debt that was due. But of course, by that point, it's, it's far too late. So at the time that this particular case came to light, I did an Official Information Act request, and I do a lot of these, but this was the one and only time I've ever had a same-day response. <laughs> and what I did was I asked the Ministry of Social Development, because in the media it was reported that, and I'll, I'll read you the quote, the, the punitive culture at Wins led directly to the recent suicide of one of the people it was meant to be helping. And one of the things that they were saying in the media was that the Ministry of Social Development had quotas that they were expected to achieve. So this is numbers of people that uh, were uh, cheating the system that they were seeking to find. So I uh, did an OIA to the Ministry of Social Development and their very fast response was, no, we don't have quotas. They were quite adamant. However, in their annual report, and this isn't even in the most annual, most recent annual report, they have this. They have uh, a performance measure, which is the percentage of investigations that result in an entitlement change or identification of an overpayment will be no less than 50%. Now, I had to go on Google and find out what was the difference between a quota and a performance measure, and it actually turns out there's really nothing. So this, you know, this, this is really a quota. If you have a look at the, the smaller print there, that was their budgeted standard last year. The actual they uh, achieved was 59%. So 59% of their investigations resulted in an entitlement change or identification of an overpayment, and the vast majority of those are, uh, are overpayments. So you know, what it does mean is it does mean that officials don't really have any incentive to be, or to engage in, in negotiations, or really even to be compassionate and kind when their incentive is actually really all about finding fraud. Um, here's another one. This is another media, um, sorry, um, yeah, media print from again last year, and there were a number of cases last year where uh, wealthy beneficiaries were being uh, prosecuted because they were begging while they were on, while they were receiving a a benefit. Now. I'm just going to put on the, the slide here um, something about income. So now if you are begging in New Zealand, this isn't taxable income, and Land Revenue are quite clear on that, they've given some guidance. Uh, so it's not taxable income, but it is money from begging, and actually most other forms of gifts as well will be treated as income for welfare purposes. So you can see from the definition there, which is the italicised bit at the bottom, Income for welfare purposes is any money received or the value in money's worth. It includes any periodical payments made, the value of any credits or services provided, so that's things like accommodation, uh, from any source for income related purposes and where they are used by the person for income related purposes. So you probably might have picked up that fairly recently, maybe two months ago, there was a case going through the courts in Auckland where somebody had a loan from a family member and uh, the MSD was arguing that this was income even though it was repayable. 
So, I mean, they, they didn't actually win the, that particular case. But there are other cases as well. Now, what the situation actually results in is that if people can't afford to live on their benefit and they can only get an extra 80 to $100 worth of extra benefits before they start losing their, their, their entitlements, if they then get you know a family loan which is repayable or um, something you know perhaps even draw down on credit cards or well, probably not credit cards but bank loans and so on um, if it's not very very clearly repayable it will result in the benefit being cut back which then of course takes them back to where they were they're still in the same situation where they have uh, an income that they can't afford to live on so it's again it's forcing people into into crime effectively into fraud where we're creating situations where people can't afford to live uh, on their income and we don't make allowances for them to have other sources of um, a resource. Now, right, so very, very briefly, I'm just going to take you away from the, the facts and the figures that I've been throwing at you up to now and just have a bit of a, a quick run through of some of the things which maybe might explain some of the differences. There is some difference in the legislation. Most of the tax cases are taken under the Tax Administration Act, which has a lower maximum penalty than the Crimes Act, and most of the welfare fraud cases, uh, the serious ones at least, are taken under the Crimes Act. So that does result in some of the welfare cases starting from a higher position of penalty, which is then discounted back. So that might explain some of the sentencing differences, at least. It certainly doesn't explain the differences to prosecutions and investigations. Uh, status, yeah, well, definitely. Uh, status is important in this issue. Uh, people who commit welfare fraud typically aren't well networked, they aren't well resourced. You know, sometimes people on benefits you know, don't have the same level of, of education uh, as people who are engaging in the more sophisticated financial crimes. And, you know, there probably is a wee bit of discrimination uh, going on. Uh, is there something in the actual way these crimes are done? So, of course, one of these crimes is not giving what you're supposed to by the way of, of tax evasion. Welfare fraud is taking more than you're entitled to. So maybe there is something, maybe society sees that as, as different, one is maybe more serious than the other. But to answer the bottom question here, is it what society wants? Now, when I started out on this research, this was another thing that I thought must be the case because the justice system is supposed to reflect what we want in society. So I, I actually thought this was what society uh, wanted. So as part of one of the earlier um, stages of this research, <coughs> excuse me, I did a quite a large survey, and one of the survey questions was, was this one here. Do you perceive any differences in someone who commits welfare fraud and someone deliberately not paying tax? And here's the result from that question. So about 60% of people said no, they didn't see any difference, and about 40% of people did say uh, yes, that they did. But, you know, we're on the, you know, on the side of the 60%, the majority of people did say there was, they didn't perceive any, any difference. So it doesn't appear overall that uh, this is reflecting society. Now, there are whole range of other things that don't explain the differences. The prosecution guidelines that we have in New Zealand certainly don't explain the differences in when prosecutions are taken. There's generally two main guidelines. One is that there's sufficient evidence and there usually is for these types of cases because there is usually, it's very clear when somebody has been engaging in tax evasion or welfare fraud. The second criteria is that it should be in the public interest. And again, I, I can't see myself why prosecuting some of these tax cases is not also in the public interest. Uh, the severity of the offence certainly doesn't explain any differences because if it did, you'd expect to see it flipped around the other way. You'd expect to see the sentences for tax evasion uh, being more punitive than welfare fraud. The Sentencing Act doesn't explain the differences. The Sentencing Act actually has um, about eight purposes. So some of them are here. So it's installing a sense of accountability in the offender, sense of responsibility, um, making sure that the interests of the victim are taken into account, 
Uh, reparation, again, that would mean that tax evasion would be seen as more serious. And then you've got things like denouncing the conduct and deterrence. And I've just asked the question as to, you know, I don't know why any of those would be more desirable for welfare fraud than for tax evasion. Uh, and so those don't explain the differences. What shouldn't explain the difference? Um, being a blue collar offender or committing a blue collar <coughs> offence is not an aggravating factor. Aggravating factor. The Sentencing Act does have a number of aggravating and mitigating factors. Being poor or wealthy are not amongst them. So as I said, there is well white collar, being a white collar offender or committing a white collar offence is not a mitigating factor. And it does really come back to the big question as to whether we treat people or whether we see people as equals. Now there's a few things that um, can be done. The data for the study was actually really very tricky to get, particularly the welfare data. Inland Revenue did provide me with some nice tax data, but for the welfare data I had to go and sit through individual courts around the country to uh, get into files. Uh, I've put here as a second bullet point, use of guideline judgments. So this strikes me as an area where you could have guideline judgments. And they are exactly what they sound like. It's basically where you have a, you know, you have a crime, say for example, $100,000 of, of financial fraud, and that then equals a particular sentence, whatever that might be. And then you might make adjustments from there to take into account aggravating or mitigating factors. But what it would do is it would lend a degree of transparency into the system which really is not present at the moment and that links on to the third bullet point there which is uh, you know I do think we really need greater transparency of measurement and reporting. Now I'll link to my that's a, a segue to my next slide when I started this uh, project and when I started getting some of the results what I did was I thought well, I really do need to talk to judges because clearly they are an important part of this this whole um, uh, situation. So one of the things you have to do in New Zealand is if you want to speak to judges you have to go through a judicial uh, research committee and when I did this I got um, a letter back from the Chief Justice and I put a couple of quotes from this letter and one of them says uh, the decision that judgments that judges make must speak for themselves. Judges cannot add reasons or provide an explanation for a decision they have made. And then with specific reference to my research, judges will inevitably be drawn into comment on sentencing decisions which cannot appropriately be subject to expansion or explanation and must speak for themselves. Judges could also be drawn into comment on the conduct of prosecutions. In neither case is judicial comment appropriate. And accordingly, my application was denied. Now, I, you know, I'm not sure about this. I, I do think that there is room for accountability in the justice system. I think if you're funded by the taxpayer, then you, know, you should be accountable to the taxpayer. Uh, however, I have had the opportunity to talk to judges in Australia. They are somewhat less um, protective of their judiciary. And one, I'll just repeat to you one comment that was made to me by a very colourful Australian judge. And when I said to him, you know, is this right? Because Australia has the same problem. You know, is it really right? Do we treat people so differently and he said well yeah yeah of course it is he was quite relaxed about it he said you know these are the and he's talking about the white collar criminals these are the people you went to school with they're the people you network with they're the people that you play golf with on the weekend <laughs> and you know i just thought oh gosh really that's <laughs> It's not a, not a solid enough answer, is it? You you know you really would hope for something slightly more robust than that. Anyway, I have got uh, just a couple of slides to finish up with. Now you'll remember at the start of the presentation, I showed you a nice slide of Arana Park, and I gave you the scenario with uh, the the white collar offender who had done a few months home detention, had repaid none of the money that he stole, and was a policeman and an accountant. 
So that's one end of the spectrum. I am going to show you now two slides which I've copied from a letter that was on one of the files that I saw in one of the courts. There was a lot of um, quite sad stories on the, the case files. I've left in the spelling mistake so you'll get a feel for how it is. So this lady was looking at nine months in jail. She had committed relationship fraud. She had a partner. She was living in a relationship in the nature of marriage, as it is called. She received a benefit and an accommodation supplement, and her partner did not contribute to her living expenses. Now, here's what she said in her letter. The reasons I stayed on the benefit were not out of greed or wanting things. I was with a man who drank five days out of seven and gambled all his money away, and although I should have left him, I didn't until last year. So I stayed on a benefit to support and care for my two children. If I could, have, if I could turn back the clock, I would not have done it. Now, then she goes on to say, I'm a good mum, love my kids more than life itself, breaks my heart to think of being away from the kids for so long. I feel sick to my stomach at the thought of them being punished for my mistakes. I've learnt my lesson the hard way. Uh, the last six months have been hell for me. I'm so very sorry for what I've done. No matter what your decision is today, home detention or jail, I deserve whatever you give me as I am in the wrong. And I promise you that after today you will never see me in the courtroom again. Thank you for making time to read my letter. And look, I'll go back to what I said at the start, which is that for most people, if they had to choose between feeding their children and committing welfare fraud, you know, you can sort of see why they would think that welfare fraud was the lesser of those two evils. And uh, just before I show you my last slide, I would say that, you know, again, um, sometimes the system does put people in places where they just don't have much in the way of choice, but we don't do the same thing for people who are wealthy. We don't put them in situations where they have to choose between paying their debts, their tax debts, and feeding their family. We have provisions that take care of that. So to conclude, so the aim of really everything that I've done in the study is to highlight the punitive outcomes that arise from what I've uh, called the criminalisation of the poor in New Zealand. The poor, they really are an, an easy target for attack and from reform. They're not typically well networked, they have few resources. You know, politically, there's not really a lot of, um, a lot of votes to be gained by defending people who are either on welfare or are engaging in welfare fraud. You know, non-workers non uh, non are not typically viewed as, as you know, the most sympathetic of, of people in the system. So, um, look, I will leave it there and um, say, Namihi Nui, thank you so much everybody for listening and for coming along tonight. So, um, as Lisa said at the beginning, part of the reason we do these this lecture series is to contextualise work, to, to put our researchers into a context. So I'm just going to chat with Lisa a little bit about um, some of that wider contextual uh, material before then I'm going to open it up to you because it was a great talk and I'm sure there are lots of questions from the audience. So my first question, Lisa, and I think we can see it implicitly in what you've presented to us this evening, but I want to ask you to reflect on it explicitly. You're a chartered accountant, you clearly had a very successful career, both nationally and internationally. Why become an academic? <laughs> <laughs> ah, oh my goodness, that's, that's, um, that's a tricky one, isn't it? And I have to be careful because I've got academic colleagues in the, in the room here. Um, look, I think, you know, the, the, the life of an academic is such a, such a privilege, and I genuinely mean that. We have such freedom to pursue what we think is important, and, and, and also, you know, in our Education Act, we do still say that universities and academics are the critics and the conscience of society. And it's something that really resonates with me. I think because we do have that ability to have freedom with what we research, and with that freedom comes the responsibility to, you know, to at least try to do something valuable with that research. So when I um, did become an academic, which I must admit, I, I sort of started doing a master's degree and a, a PhD really because I'd got a little bit tired of working and it was just a bit of a nice escape at the time. But then once I started seeing the world of, of academia and what you could do, uh, there was, you know, there was just sort of no turning back really. Fantastic. Um, 
that was a deceptively simple presentation that you gave us. It was beautifully presented and, and the messages were really clear. Um, you talked at some point about the challenges of gathering your data, but the kind of work that you do is enormously challenging more generally. And so again, I'd just like you to reflect a little bit on what, what's the really doing this work, which is such important work, what are the, the biggest challenges in doing this work? Okay. Um, you know, it's it's interesting talking to the audience here because I speak, I suspect to a, a really large extent, I'm possibly talking to people who are the, the conversion. If I can, if I can say that, you know, it's people who understand these issues and uh, appreciate the importance of them and knowing the need to to highlight them and um, and just just talk about them. I think one of the challenges is. Maybe just trying to, and, and of course we all want people to think the way that, that we think, but perhaps getting the messages out a wee bit wider, and I, you know, I'd love to see this as something that, that would be um, perhaps just more generally ex ex talked about in society. We don't spend a lot of time looking in depth at how difficult life is for people trying to survive on a welfare benefit. And there's so much negative press around people who are dependent on society. But really, you know, as a compassionate and considerate society like we are in New Zealand, I, you know, I think we should be changing the, the narrative to, to really look <coughs> at how we can improve the, the lot of people who are on welfare. My last question is, I um, uh, reflected on your presentation, and um, I'm a social scientist, so uh, some of what you were talking about was, was very familiar to me from having worked in domains like social policy or, or political science, you published very widely. You've chosen to locate yourself in a business school, so you're in the Victoria Business School. Was that a deliberate decision about intellectual positioning? And what difference do you think it makes being in a business school as opposed to um, a political science department or, or a social policy department? Ooh, okay. Um, I think one of the things that I would say is we're very lucky at Victoria Business School because they are quite accepting of my research and not all business schools would be. Uh, this is this is not the type of research that usually comes out of a business school. Uh, so in that in that respect I you know I am really um, really quite lucky. Uh, it probably wasn't deliberate positioning to a certain extent because I think as an academic you you find a home and you know you you stay there. But um, but I would say we we've had uh, great leadership in the business school uh, and certainly our current Dean Ian Williamson, if anybody knows him, uh, is really a, a, a great um, a great fan of social justice research. I mean, he's, he understands that a business school also needs to focus on the economic issues, but he understands that the social is important to have alongside that. Mm.